Good morning. Today I'm going to present some of the work that I've been um, working on with an ERC project with my colleagues Margarita Gleber, um, Bella Dimova, who's also here today, um, where we're looking at the production and consumption of textiles in early urban economies of the first half of the first millennium BC. So today I want to travel across the Mediterranean to Greece and in particular to Athens slightly earlier than the picture on the slide. I'm looking at the core of, the, of archaic Greece, in particular those of the 6th century BC. This was an important period in the development of early urban centers and the lifestyle that went with them. And with that lifestyle, of course, was a very elaborate material culture, imported goods, very fine and decadent uh, ceramics and metals, and also textiles. As we know, and we're familiar with the idea that textiles are ways that people differentiate themselves by uh, gender, class, status. But it's also, in this period, a way that people made themselves urban, made themselves into those urbanites and part of this uh, elite lifestyle of the Mediterranean. So what I want to do today in this research <laughs> is really take a textile approach to looking at the iconography. And I want to think about how the textiles were part of the way people made themselves into these urbanites. And I want to do this by considering some seemingly quite simple questions. I want to think about, you know, what quantity of textiles do people have in a costume? How many layers were there? What, what size were there? And I also want to think about the quality. What quality of these textiles were they? Were they coloured, patterned, etc.? The Greek chori, in the centre we have a reproduction of one of those with the colourful pigments, are young women and also young goddesses. So these really represent very much the most wealthy aspect of this urban uh, society. <coughs> As anyone will know who's looked into this, uh, this research area, there is really substantial debate on the nature of archaic Greek clothing. And this stems in part from the analysis of the text, so the early Greek textual sources and the iconography, in particular sort of mismatch and difficulty in connecting those two. These lovely figures from Mireille, Mireille Lee's book show the ideas of different garments, such as the peplos and keton, as two of the most well-known um, garments from, that we know the words for from these early texts. In terms of the iconography, if we trace back the genealogy of the idea of the iconography of the different clothing types, we end up uh, going back to Bieber, who was writing in the 1930s, and Richter writing in the 1960s as the main sources. And they really establish a sort of canon or an authority on interpreting these textile garments of the, the archaic Greek men and women. And sometimes, when things didn't fit between the iconography and the text, scholars suggested that the artists got confused. <laughs> and so it's not strange to find this sort of, these sorts of quotes so boredom. Often the distinction in dress is thoroughly confused. Richter, we're, off, we're after all confronted with works of art, not living things, so blaming it on the art. And some of the clothing arrangements are so complex on, on occasion so baffling as to defy attempts to explain and categorize them. So this is coming up to a very recent work here. So what I'd like us to do, rather controversially, is put a bit of faith in our Greek uh, sculptors and, and consider what they were trying to show, because they actually showed the textiles in great detail. They put a lot of effort into them. They sculpted the stone in relief to show textiles. They've engraved small patterns on them to show the motifs and decoration, and then they've painted them. And the Korai are an excellent place to look at different textiles because there's so much detail in these sculptures. And what I want to do with this work, in taking a textile approach, is to move away from thinking about garments, instead think about textiles. And my question really, when I was confronted with these statues, was to think, well, how many textiles are there on one of these female statues? 
So very quickly, to think about clothing is actually a very complex group of technologies. We have the cloth, the, sort of the material that the clothing's made from, so the textiles that I'm focusing on. These are made into clothing, into garments, which are then combined into costumes. So these are several different technologies. And my focus is thinking about the textiles. So this is a statue of Frasiclea, a wealthy, or, uh, wealthy young woman who is buried in the, or not buried, the statue is of this woman in the mid-sixth mid millennium BC, and it was found in 1972. I examined this sculpture in the National Museum of Athens, I've also looked at the literature and also the results from polychromy, so the analysis of the pigment, which I think gives really important details now for understanding the clothing. So how many textiles do I think that are on Frasiclea? I think there's one, possibly two, large red textiles that may have motifs woven onto them or woven in or stitched onto them. In addition, then I think across the shoulders, there are two meander pattern borders across the neck and on the sleeves. This is a different pattern band from that on the hem. And then I think there's one long central band from the neck to the hem. This is a multi, has a multicolored meander pattern on it. <coughs> on the sculpture, this band stands out several millimeters from the rest of the statue, maybe suggesting it was stitched on or applied. On top of that, on the, on the statue, there's little remnants of gold leaf, so maybe this wonderful elaborate garment also had these big gold discs that we know from the archaeology of earlier periods. Oh, sorry, I'll just go back. So how many textiles in the little box? When we're thinking of how many textiles, we could have up to four different textiles on here. Some large ones and some of these pattern bands. The second core that I want to look at is the Peplos core. The similar date, 530 BC. This was discovered in the late 19th century. And the statue is likely to be Artemis, Athena, a goddess. Certainly someone really very much, um, the, a woman very much showing the wealth of these material cultures of the early urban centers. So Richter, in her analysis of the 1960s, and people subsequently have typically seen this as two garments. So, shown in a blue color here, there's a crinkly texture engraved uh, in the relief of the stone that the sculpture's made. And this is shown on the elbow, the right elbow area and around the feet. <coughs> this is seen as one, the first layer. And the second layer of the garment is what's shown in red here, and which gives her the name of the Peplos Core. Cor with the different pattern bands we can see and a central pattern band down the front. Here the work on polychromy has been important. So the work of Koch and Brinkman and team identified through the pigment what they, what they suggest is a third textile on this figure. And so rather than seeing this as simply decoration at the front of the, of the peplos, I actually think this is a separate garment that's only shown in pigment. And this has a frieze of banded um, uh, animals and other, other features. You can see there, there's a red ground to the textile with these decorative motifs. So how many textiles do we see on this peplos core then? Well, I should say, how many textiles do I see? Um, <laughs> I think underneath we have two large crinkly textiles, maybe, maybe one, maybe two of those. Followed by that, under, in that central area, a second, a second layer of textiles with this frieze, the red ground textile with this complex animal banded frieze at the center, which then goes up the body. We don't see where that finishes. And the third layer, ooh, lost it. On top of that is this large textile with little blue crosses. And on two sides of that, we have these uh, pattern borders, the red and blue 
decorative lotus bud palmate um, design pattern borders, which creates the overfold here. I think this is quite possibly, these borders could quite possibly be to either a starting and finishing border or the, the edge, <coughs> edges of the textiles created um, matching each other because these are the same patterns. So this is a very large textile with elaborate edges. But then on top of that, what's going on with these green bands with the rosettes on either side of that central split in the, in the second layer of garment, sorry, third layer of garment. Are these then additional applied um, textile bands on this textile? So how many textiles might we have here? Oh, and no, I missed, missed the last one. And then there's a small tied belt, um, the blue and green around her waist. So how many textiles do we have here? I think we could have five different textiles, three of them really large textiles, and some of the, the bands, the belts, smaller decorative areas. The Koro wearing a keton, we'll start to see some familiar um, motifs coming up here. I think similarly, there's this crinkle pattern texture on the top area of the body, and I think this is maybe one or two large textiles. We don't know how far it goes down. And around the base, then there's very different texture in the stone. And I think this is a second, probably very long textile that's pleated, in particular at the front under that central band, there's a huge wadge of pleats, so showing a lot of fabric in there. There's a little bit of patterning on it. Whether or not there's a central band, we don't know without someone working on the polychromy on that. But possibly there was also a central band in that area which we see in the center of the legs. So in terms of how many textiles, maybe there were two very large textiles and the central band on this coro. And the last one, the most complex and maybe the baffling one that we got at the beginning, how many textiles do I think are on this coro? Again, in that top area, we see this crinkled textures just on one of the shoulder, crinkled textured textile, which I suggest would be, again, hanging from the shoulders, large textile. On the upper area, there's a very fancy red band across the neck and shoulder. But then what's going on with the rest of it? You know, maybe this is one absolutely huge textile with the complex draping across the top and the lower area. That's a possibility, or maybe it was two separate areas. And so around the lower part of the body, um, this smooth area with the folds, you see a textile with um, the blue motifs on it. Also, this very fancy central band. Presumably a belt holding it together. And then at the top, there's a, very, there's a textile with similar motifs to the area, to the lower area. But this seems like the very, one of the very largest textiles on here. There's a lot of folds and uh, pleating. But this also has a red band in the lower area and on the shoulders, a blue, the blue band on the shoulders. And I think this is quite likely something folded in half and into the quarter is the front that we see here draped around the body. So we see this area a bit. So how many textiles on that core? If we count them in the way I'm looking at, there could be up to eight textiles. Some of those really large, some of them smaller bands. In terms of what kind of textiles I think they are, from work by uh, Greek colleagues and also my other colleagues on the project, I think that some of these smoother areas of the statue could well relate to the um, weft-faced tabbies that we find in Greece. And much rarer are these um, fine open tabbies in linen with the overspun yarns. And I think this could well be the sort of textile that creates that crinkly effect in the top area of many of the coro. Also, the idea of the figurative um, textiles, which are much rarer, of course, found <coughs> archaeologically. I think these um, could well relate to the sort of thing we hear Penelope weaving in, with the shrouds and also see in the iconography, as in this example from Cusi. So really, to sum up, what were these... Um, and I've lost my page. 
Let me find this again. Let me find it. <laughs> You know, how were people dressing themselves? Okay, time. People were, have, there are very large textiles. They're numerous, there are multiple layers. There's contrasting textures, bold colors, and patterns. Textiles, of course, take a very long time to make, and they're, con they're time consuming and use lots of resources. But I hope by seeing the clothing on the archaic Koro from a textile perspective rather than a garment one, this reinforces actually the wealth of the textile material culture that we're seeing at this time. And we can see these as the, sort of the valuables that they were in, that, uh, in these early urban areas. Okay, thank you.